You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Tuesday. April 16th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, John Patrick Leary on keywords, the new language of capitalism. Also on the program today, Notre Dame Cathedral suffers a colossal damage in a fire. And Trump Administration Interior Secretary David Bernhardt sets a new land speed record for the start of an ethics investigation launch. Records all over the place. Just four days after his confirmation. Meanwhile, the U.S. deports a spouse of a U.S. soldier killed in Afghanistan and then reels it back in. Sixty of America's biggest companies paid no federal income tax. And new documents show Facebook, surprise, surprise, lied about protecting user data privacy. Meanwhile, Bernie drank Fox's milkshake last night and... Dropped his taxes. It's pretty good, actually. It's pretty good. House Democrats subpoena Deutsche Bank for Trump records. And a California city does a UBI experiment. Lastly, Bill Weld makes it official. He will face Trump, who has over 85% Republican approval. Good for Bill Weld, though. Yes. Props to Bill Weld. All this and more on today's program. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, We have a lot to get to today. Crazy day. As you know, um, the Mueller report is coming out in a couple of days, and uh, we don't know exactly when that's going to happen. My guess would be uh, just the moment we go on vacation would be uh, when I would predict that would happen. And in which case, I imagine there will be major revelations. And a YouTube Live, maybe? What's that? Are you going to stream? Yeah, yeah, I would definitely do that. If I could get the kids to be quiet. Five seconds. Uh, meanwhile, a couple of uh, I, uh, emails we got. Um, one is from listener Stephen. This was uh, four days ago. So just, just a reminder for tomorrow. It would be cool if you guys could do a brief segment on the Alberta election in Canada after 42 years of a consecutive conservative government A modest center left party was elected, New Democratic Party, and has been attempting to bring our oil producing province with politics akin to Texas into line, surpassing other Canadian provinces in social and economic policies. The leader of the UCP, the United Conservative Party, Jason Kenney, is extremely dangerous and numerous candidates in his party have had to drop out due to racist, misogynist and homophobic views. Uh, so that uh, election is tomorrow, and that probably will be the extent of our coverage of that Alberta election. But I uh, just wanted to mention it. Uh, we will be doing something on the big Winnipeg strike, right, uh, on the day that that happens in May or the anniversary, I guess. Literally within the hour when it started. We're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be doing it within the hour. We're really taught where we are so here with the Winnipeg uh, st- uh, general strike. That uh, we're going to be almost recreating the whole thing. That's O Canada, but... There you go. Uh, Also, uh, this from uh, listener uh, Esme. Uh, Hey, Majority Report team. Just found out your your shows a couple of weeks ago and so grateful for all your work that it's the first time our household donated cash to political news. Well, thank you. Oh, wow. Looking forward to upping our contribution when we can because uh, what you're doing is so valuable. I'm an Australian living in Rhode Island. Mm. Moved from Melbourne two years ago. And it's been tough. Sam is from Worcester, Mass., right? 
What advice does Sam or anyone else on team have for enduring, challenging New York, uh, New England centrism? Uh, and still also, uh, and also still have friends and family. Well, the problem is, uh, is Rhode Island really? Uh, that is really the problem. I would tell you head on 146, go North to Worcester. Uh, Worcester has one of the most progressive, uh, congressmen in the country, uh, Jim McGovern. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It's Rhode Island is the problem. Um, is there, I can't think of any progressive leaders in Rhode Island right now. No, no. I mean, I guess the senators are decent. Sheldon Whitehouse and Decent. Jack Reed, liberal but not but great. Not, no, they're not great. Not well, great. Maybe try heading up uh, Providence or Narragansett. <laughs> there's a good little artsy community there. I don't know about the actual government and power, but there's some cool people. But yeah, yeah, there's cool people. Fun. There's there's cool people in uh, in Providence, but um, in uh, a certain Rhode sense. Island, yeah, in sort a certain of. Sense. Roger Williams. Mm. Uh, I'm a big fan of Melbourne. I saw a uh, Footscray uh, play uh, there, uh, Aussie Rules uh, Football, uh, I guess now 27 years ago. Um, all those guys who were probably playing on that team have all probably retired and passed away. So uh, that was fun. Uh, but thank you for the email. I love, uh, I love Melbourne. Love to hear from Australian people. And uh, on with the show. Last night, Bernie Sanders had a... Um, Town Hall on Fox. And we're going to talk more about this later in the program. But I think that uh, Sanders managed to do two things. He managed to both and to do this almost simultaneously. And we're going to play some other clips that will, I think, really. um, uh, Really uh, uh, exemplify this. And I think both these things were were equally important, not necessarily for his campaign, but for just the 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 politics of our country. One was he was able to pitch very effectively to an audience that seemed to be sort of surprisingly excited, not just open, but excited about these policies. And two, simultaneously undercut the credibility of Fox. And uh, this was, you know, and this is no small feat. He was not... um, Kissing their uh, their their uh, patoots, as it were, uh, but he also was was just making his pitch. I mean, I think that's probably Bernie's strength is that that he seems to do that no matter where he is, uh, frankly. But um, and you know, some people think that's you know he's sort of too mono maniacal in that respect, but quite effective in this context. Uh, here is um, <laughs> basically Brett ba- uh, Bear. Um, I, I don't know what to do. Like this was, n- this did not go the way that I think Fox News planned. Here's Brett Bear doing the old uh, show of hands. Let's try and intimidate Bernie, and then all of a sudden, like if Brett Bear was a turtle, let's put it this way, you wouldn't see much of his face after this. People, um, this audience, this audience has a lot of Democrats in it. It has uh, Republicans, independents, Democratic Socialists, conservatives. Uh, I want to ask the audience a question, if you could raise your hand here. A show of hands of how many people get their insurance from work, private insurance, right now. How many get it from private insurance? Wow, almost the whole room. Now, of those, how many are willing to transition to what the senator says, a government-run system? Wow. There's 180 million people on private insurance. All right, let's deal with that, Brett. And they, question. they would be Pause lost, it for right? one second. That's a smooth yeah, so transition. Now, right? I like there. He's just like, uh, ooh. Right, I'm not work. going okay. to yeah. acknowledge what the results of that were. I'm just going to. I mean, that is pretty. Do, do, do. That, honestly, like that moment where he just like immediately pivots to like, that didn't work out. Well, uh, let's go to the other damning statistic we have that's very intimidating. I was just trying to illustrate what a non-scientific sample looks like. Right, Exactly. This, of course, uh, despite my setup, like <laughs> that this was a balanced crew of everybody. It seemed to be one for one. Everybody uh, wanted to get rid of their their insurance. All right. So pick it up from here. And, and, and they were smart. They did not cut on on Brett to his comp- the look on his that must have been on his face when he was like, because, you know, 
if it was like, now you got a tough sell, Senator Sanders. You see the whole room. Got to convince these you people. You got to convince these people. How are you yeah, going to do that? I don't that? know. Looking a little rough. Yeah, this is looking a little. Uh, just uh, another statistic I can throw in there, but go ahead. There's 180 million people on private insurance. All right, let's deal with that, Brett. And Fair they, question. they Brett. would be lost, right? Oh, Brett. To a, your Brett. system. Fair okay. question. Just go face, Brett. Good, thank and you. I know it's what the right wing throws out, so let me answer it. All right? <laughs> Millions of people every single year lose their health insurance. You know why? They get fired or they quit and they go to another employer. I was a mayor for eight years. You know what I did, what probably every mayor in America does? is you look around for the best insurance program, the most cost-effective insurance. You change insurance. Every year, millions of workers wake up in the morning and their employer has changed the insurance that they have. Maybe they like the doctors. People are nodding their heads. Okay, so this is not new. Every year. Now, what we are talking about, actually, is stability. That when you have a Medicare for all, it is there now and will be there in the future. I'm not wow. even going to just mention that you got faced, Brett. But right. if you could at least give me the courtesy of debunking your tired, exhausted, stupid talking point. Uh, I mean, it's sort of, really sort of stunning uh, that like you could not have, you really get the sense that Brett Bear, and we're going to play more of these clips uh, later in the program, because they get, I think, like Brett and Martha, uh, and I can't remember her last name, uh, McCollum. McCollum. McCollum, get increasingly more frustrated i think as the evening is going on because it is not going well for them and there's no way when they head back to the commissary today and they're in line at lunch and everybody gathers around the commissary at fox they're gonna the people are gonna be giving them sideways looks well what's funny what i found funny uh, about good that job martha <laughs> what i found you funny about that, that particular one. dynamic is that it was more frustrating, I think, for Brett because he still needs to maintain the semblance of being a straight reporter. And Martha was more willing to just be like, oh, this isn't going bad. So let me like turn the guns on a little right. bit because she's a little bit more on the overt opinion side. I mean, they both failed. But I think Brett's tension of like, this is absolutely not going the way it's supposed to. But I'm supposed to also pretend right, that, that I'm I don't okay care, with it. That I don't care. Right. That little laugh he did after Bernie's like, I know that's what the right wing's throwing out. He's like, ha, ha. you know, he wants to be like, oh, you suck. Well, I, I, I uh, would put the chances, and it's now 12, 15 off, p.m. Man. Eastern. I would put the chances of of Hannity going up to Brett Bear right now in line at the commissary and like just going, looking at him and just taking his like, uh, you know, whatever. He's got the rice pudding he probably pulled from the commissary thing and he's just taking it and he's just going, good job. <laughs> so mad. And here, uh, here is Donald Trump in, like, this is one of those things where you just like, oh, the tweet itself is not that crazy. And then you realize, like, it's insane that the president of the United States is writing this. And he writes, so weird to watch crazy Bernie on Fox News. Not surprisingly, Brett Baer and the audience, in quotes, was so smiley and nice. Very strange. And now we have Donna Brazil? What? Question mark? <laughs> so. It makes sense. Like, I can't handle it. I've got, like, my show, and I'm used to not watching in Fox and see. And, the, I mean, it does. He's, he's, I can't tell if he is tweeting this as an audience member or if when he says, and now we have Donna Brazil, if he's talking about, like, as a member of the administration of Fox. I feel like it's viewer. I, I see himself as like a view, I think he sees himself as a viewer who gets to have input. I'm a man of the people. I'm so, just the regular Fox News viewer. I'm not but, pulling rank. So I, I, I didn't watch it, but Donna Brazil did not make an appearance on the program last night? No, no. This is a completely this is this is him trying to this this I, I mean, if you really start to think about it, this is and I don't know if he does this consciously or not, but this really um I, what he is surprising, what he's surprised about, and he's saying not surprisingly, but what he's surprised about is how well Bernie did here. Because the implication is that the Fox, Fox is getting soft, right? That they were too smiley and nice. Brett Bear was, and the audience was too yeah, nice. The refs were really letting them get away with everything. The fact that, it, the fact that they now have Donna Brazil on there shows how soft Fox is getting and that they're actually... What he's basically saying is Fox is rigged. And Fox is totally rigged. They could have called him a crazy Jew, Shylock Bernie. I'm going to watch MSNBC a now. Lesbian? Can I'm going to watch MSNBC now. They're the only ones that treat Bernie fair. Hey, uh, folks, 
Uh, when I go on uh, on television, you know uh, the one thing that you can count on, and that is that I have shaved with my Harry's razor. Why is that? Well, uh, for me, I think people know why I love Harry's. Uh, from a utilitarian perspective, the narrowness of the blade uh, has been a big upshot for me. Um, Someone uh, friends with me uh, most uh, most recently uh, just recognized that I have asymmetry in my nostrils, uh, which I try and keep on the down low, but uh, I do. Uh, just you know, someone who was looking up my nose, and uh, and and so uh, they now appreciate the value that I place on the narrowness of the um, of the Harry's razor head. The other thing that I like too is the. Um, is the handle. It's just, it's very sort of like classic lines and uh, not, you know, I don't feel like I'm all buffy like R- Rambo with the uh, the ones that you get. You know what I'm talking about? Like the 14 different treads. G.I. Joe. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, the really, really elaborate ones. Yeah. And uh, Harry's founders were, were tired of paying up for razors that were overpriced and overdesigned. They knew a great shave didn't come from gimmicks like vibrating heads or flex balls or handles that look like spaceships. That's my point. Uh, so they bought World Class Blade Factory in Germany, started making razors that combine simple, clean design with quality, durable razors at a fair price. A Harry's replacement cartridge costs two bucks. And all Harry's blades come with a 100% guarantee. Uh, they've gotten over 20,000 five-star reviews on Trustpilot and Google. Now you can get a $13 value trial set that comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave. The weighted ergonomic handle I spoke of earlier, the five-blade razor with a lubricating strip, and trimmer blade, which we call the Sam blade around here. We don't really. A uh, rich lathering shave gel, a travel blade cover. Listeners of my show can redeem their trial set at harrys.com slash majority report. Make sure you go to harrys.com slash majority report to redeem your offer and let them know I sent you to help support the show. Speaking of supporting the show, one of today's sponsors is Skillshare. Now, anyone who goes to skl.sh slash Majority Report 2 is going to get two whole months free in use of Skillshare's entire library of super quality online courses and tutorials. Skillshare is a vibrant online community that offers courses on everything from design to video editing to photography business, technology, cooking, uh, meditation, everything in between. There are uh, 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 Skillshare courses for everyone. You'll have no problem finding courses that will be useful for you both in your personal life and in your professional life. Uh, Whether you want to sharpen your skills with something you already love doing or whether you want to learn how to do something totally new, Skillshare has you covered. They have courses for entrepreneurs, courses on computer coding, web development, personal nutrition, learning new languages, Photoshop, you name it. You can check out going freelance, building uh, and branding your own success, uh, or how to do presentations, how to use, um, you know, uh, Photoshop or, or others. I mean, it, it just goes on and on and on. Let me, let's see, what do we got for writing here? Storytelling, character Conflict, context, and craft. Writing characters. Creative personal writing. There's tons of this stuff. You can get two entire months free. You'll have access to every single course offered by Skillshare by going to skl.sh slash majority report two. Just think of everything you're going to have at your fingertips for two whole months free. Again, that's skl.sh slash majority report two i put a link underneath this video if you're watching on youtube and of course we put all the uh, links in our podcast uh, uh audio description as well i'm gonna take a quick break when we come back i'm gonna be talking to john patrick leary on keywords the new language of capitalism <laughs>
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Just a reminder, you can support this show by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. You get the uh, free show, and then we give you extra content every day on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program English professor at Wayne State University and author of Keywords, The New Language of Capitalism, John Patrick Leary. John, uh, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Um, so this is, I, I, I really enjoy this book and these type of um, uh, 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 approaches to sort of making us more conscious of the way that we, we speak and what the implications are. Uh, but before we sort of dig into some of the, uh, the words here um, and that, you, that you examine in the book, Let's just start with the way that you define, because you, these are words that um, have been, I guess, I'm not sure how to phrase this, brought to us by late stage capitalism. But what does what does late stage capitalism mean to you? <laughs> and you're starting with the uh, tough ones right, aw- right off the bat. Huh? Um, well, you know, basically it means the latest form of capitalism. I think that's the best and most concise definition that uh, I know, which is to say, on the one hand, it is characterized by a lot of um, by a, a particular vocabulary of of uh, rebellion, of artistry, of individualism, of um, individual possibilities through the market, and so that is what gives um, rise to something as peculiar in historical context as like the creative creative capitalism or the creative class. Um, But on the other hand, it also implies that uh, this is merely a new twist on something very old. And so that's one of the um, points that I uh, like to really emphasize about this book is that, um, you know, our, our current economic vocabulary is really big on constantly celebrating novelty, you know, constantly celebrating innovation and so forth. And um, the point is that a lot of our, um, a lot of what passes for novelty in our, in our world is, is just slightly different forms of the old forms of exploitation. And so it's the latest form of something old. It's a new twist on an old story. Uh, you know, the, it's interesting you, you, you say that because I think, you know, uh, Corey Robin, uh, Robin's um, uh, definition of, of reactionaryism is, is, is very similar to that. The idea that you're sort of repackaging um, the uh, and maybe not so much in terms of um, uh, uh, capitalism per se, but you're repackaging uh, the sort of pre-existing and the long time existing uh, power dynamics and uh, making them cool and seem rebellious in some fashion. Yeah. And a lot of, in, in the story I'm kind of telling in some of these words and innovation is, is a particularly good example. Um, they come about sometimes in, in deliberate ways, sometimes sort of organically, but um, as, as ways of responding to old critiques of, of capitalism. So in the, you know, in the depression in the 1930s and forties, the, um, the and then in the post-war period the idea of big business was something really toxic in american culture big business was seen as with great suspicion and the life of a businessman was seen as a, a kind of a life of conformity you know the this is like the organization man idea and so innovation becomes a way of sort of celebrating um the idea of personal liberation and personal fulfillment through trudging off to the office every day and that's a kind of um, phenomenon that I think is uh, that is very much with us now, but its origins are you know about half a century ago. Is there? I mean, is that? And and, and you know, I want to get into some of the specifics of the words again, but um, but but staying sort of like um, uh, just a little bit uh, uh, ten thousand feet. Is there? Is there a? Are, are, can you organize the development of these words, or I guess like the. Um, not so much the development, but the adoption and the, the the frequency of use of these words. Are there different ways? Are are, are there you know uh, main categories of the ways in which these happen? Are they, for instance, are they 
to serve in the same function that you were just talking about? Like, um, I mean, for instance, you know, I just got back from a trial lawyer conference and they don't necessarily call themselves trial lawyers anymore because trial lawyers got uh, maligned. So they refer to themselves sometimes as plaintiff attorneys. And um, and so we see this, you know, development uh, happen when, like you say, uh, there is a perspective that, you know, being been part of a big business is is seen as being ossified, so we come up with the word innovation. Is that is that the way that these words um, uh, enter into the lexicon, or is it? Uh, are there other roots as well? Well, I'd say that's most of them function in kind of that way. They don't always have a, a particular author, or you know, there's not necessarily one guy who thought of um, saying innovation all the time, you know. But they do function in a way to as substitutes or as evasions for what we're really talking about. So the, one, one of the best examples is human capital, which I talk about in the book, which is really just um, a way of saying labor without talking about, without using that, that dirty word, um, if you're an economist. And so um, it's a way of um, talking about something that might be characterized by, you know, exploitation or uh, mistreatment, um, as being a resource and not just as a resource, but as a resource for your own self, you know, your, your work is your own human capital. You're not, um, beholden to a boss in that kind of imagination. So it's a way of talking about work without talking about, um, inequality or, uh, exploitation at work. Um, all right. So let's talk about some of the, the sort of the categories here of, uh, that, that you, you break it down to, um, one is, uh, late capitalist body talk, and we sh- I should just tell people that the the contents, um, like the, the I guess the chapters of your book, I guess, um, are it's really just a list of you know you have a list of I guess about thirty some odd words uh, that you um, uh, develop the, the the thesis around. So let's let's just talk about. Late capitalist uh, body talk. What's a good example of a uh, of body talk in that respect? Well, nimble is a good one. So, nimble is a word that is used in um, mainstream journalism and in financial business journalism to describe corporations that have shed labor costs, basically, or other <laughs> operating costs. So, a nimble corporation is one that. Um, can move very quickly and can leap and is spry and mobile. And it calls to mind, you know, the word, the, I think most people's association, at least English speakers association with the word nimble is, you know, the uh, nursery rhyme, Jack jumping, you know, Jack jump, jumping over the candlestick. And it's a word that Jack be nimble, a, Jack be quick. Right. Okay. Sorry. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so it's a word that used to, um, if you search it in, you know, newspaper archives, it used to only appear in the sports section because it would describe like a nimble shortstop or something. And then it became a word used to describe corporations, which is now like mostly where you find it in, um, in, in journalism. And so it's a, again, like human capital, it's a way of, of talking about work without talking about workers, basically. And then uh, flexible is another um, is another one. And unlike nimble, flexible is used to describe workers. But again, it's used to describe increasingly onerous work schedules in which you have to be ready to appear at your job at the mall or at Starbucks or something at a different time every day. You know, you have a flexible schedule. But instead of describing that as extremely difficult and painful and um, disruptive to your daily life and to your family life and so forth, it uh, frames it as if it's like a... Like a um, positive. Like a positive, yes, a positive attribute. So, I mean, people could say like, oh, yeah, no, I've got an inconsistent schedule as opposed to I'm on a flexible schedule. That has very different uh, connotations as to who is bearing the burden of that uh, that schedule, right? I mean, it's just sort of uh, the idea is that yeah, no, I have uh, my schedule is flexible, but in fact, it's not the schedule that is a- that is actually flexible. It is the human who is being asked to be flexible. Yeah, and if you think about if you follow that metaphor a little bit further, then you're talking about people being 
bent and contorted in all kinds of different di painful directions. But, you know, we usually don't get that far when we're talking about a flexible work or, or, or a flexible work schedule. And, 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 and to be clear, like this is language that just sort of sticks, right? Like people find, I mean, I, people find that as they, you know, someone just threw this out in what, in, in one conversation, it seems like, or maybe somebody wrote a, um, uh, an HR, uh, you know, newsletter saying we're going to ask for more, you know, for a flexible schedule. And then everybody just found that a comfortable way to refer to what they were asking of their workers. Right. I mean, is that basically the way this stuff develops? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's hard to trace the, uh, the way some of these terms develop. And I mean, I think that's what's sort of interesting about them. And that's what makes them um, keywords is that they are, they kind of diagnose a collective or conventional wisdom or conventional stupidity as the case often is, but it's a, it's not something that um, a, like a, an evil genius developed or invented at some particular moment. It's, uh, it's something that expresses, you know, the way that we talk about, uh, our lives under, um, you know, late stage capitalism. And so it's, it's a good way I think of diagnosing some of the, the ways of thinking that have become conventional. Um, let's talk about the, the moral vocabulary, uh, of late, uh, capitalism. Um, mm -hmm. wh what is, wh give us a couple examples of those. Well, uh, innovation is one. I mean, innovation has a has a kind of strange and long history uh, as a religious word. For the longest time, it was a term that was synonymous with a, with false prophecy. So, to innovate was to um, was to improvise upon the word the word of God in a way that um, a, a, a human wasn't allowed to do. So if you're an innovator, you were a false prophet or you were a conspirator or a heretic or something. And then it became um, kind of secularized in the 20th century and became you know, applied in the way we kind of recognize it now towards some particular task, uh, you know, a new, uh, like a new way of manufacturing a thing or distributing a thing. But it still retains that air of prophecy, I think, when we hear it used to describe, you know, great innovators or innovations in some particular firm. Um, because it's so it's so rarely used to describe any actual recognizable object or thing. It's just a sort of a spirit that a successful person um, has within them. So it's kind of a moral quality. And passion is another one. Um, that connotes some kind of innate moral capacity that's supposed to serve you well at work, um, but often is, you know, kind of like flexible is a way of um, making your poorly compensated devotion seem like a um, seem like your life's work rather than something you should be paid for. So we always hear teachers described as passionate, or um, you know, people who take care of the elderly at home are passionate about their work. Um, and we call, we, passion is sort of a substitute for um, a living wage. Right. It's, it's a, a passionate. <laughs> when we say they're passionate, we're saying they're underpaid and they don't seem to mind. Yeah. 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 They take home passion dividends instead of, um, instead of um, high wages. They would like a vacation, but instead we gave them the opportunity to do something that they seem to like. So that's basically right. I mean, that seems what it like. That's that seems to be what uh, that that word means. An innovator is to me, seems to me to be also someone who's like a rebel, right? Which also yeah. implies yeah. that on some level that like they have a certain level of freedom that exists there, right? That they're not bound by um, by by sort of I guess they're not encumbered by by what they're doing as opposed to I guess I mean I'm trying to think of like the they're rebels as opposed to people who've just found a way to sort of like pay people less in some way. I don't know. I think of like, like all the, the, the gig economy stuff is sort of like, it's a, it's a, it's a new innovation. We found how to get human beings to uh, function with just a lot less calories or something like that. <laughs> yes. Or, you know, like, uh, you know, whatever people figured out how to do um, that caused the, Economy to crash in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Those that was some innovative work too. But because we also describe innovation 
only in ever, only in positive terms. You know, it's only it's it's synonymous with improvement. Um, we that's another factor in its peculiar moral sense. But I, the point about rebellion is 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 a good one, and it's part of innovation's earlier history because it you know it was originally to to be an innovator was to be a rebel in, in a in a in a in a bad sense, but now it's the opposite. And creativity is another word that has that same that same kind of history. So you know, where once we might have thought of creative types as being unorthodox, or um, you know, they sleep late, they don't like to go to work. Um, now those kinds of attributes of idiosyncrasy or um, peculiarity or rebelliousness are kind of harvested by um, by by corporations and business schools as being like the stuff of real successful people. Right. And there's another uh, aspect of the type of words, uh, like sort of where the, where, um, the, where there's, um, there's a co-opting of, uh, of sort of, I don't want to say counterculture, but non business cultures, right? Like, uh, like uh, give us an example of that dynamic. So besides creativity, uh, the, uh, the artisan is a good example. Um, you know, the artisan is somebody who pursues some kind of craft, uh, passionately to use another word and is interested in doing so because of some devotion, you know, not to the profit motive necessarily, but to, um, you know, like an intimate attachment to to carpentry or to food or to some or to some other kinds of um, particular kind of object or business and so the um, originally you know the artisan was somebody who was sort of displaced by capitalist production you know the artisan who made a particular kind of chair was put out of work and had to go work in the assembly line making um, making cheaper chairs but the way that the word has gotten kind of absorbed into, you know, like high end consumer culture now is a way of imbuing, um, you know, manufactured goods and uh, manufactured food products with some of this era of authenticity that is thought, you know, has long been thought to be lost in, in mass production. So that's another example of the, the artistry. Thing. Like, is, is that like, like craft beer and just sort of, I guess, um, I mean, I, I, and to some extent, I would say a lot of I've, I mean, I know this in the context of of our advertisers on these programs uh, that we uh, we do here that there's that quality of like we're going to let um, people know, you know, the we're going to put the founders sort of forward and, and make it just seem like it's, you know, it's two guys and maybe it starts with just two guys or two, two girls. But it, there's yeah. that whole quality of like we're just regular people. Yeah. And it usually is, I think, two guys in those cases. I mean, maker is a kind of a similar word to um, artisan. Uh, but all these kind of words that describe some kind of tinkering um, and and careful uh, devotion to a craft are all very gendered words. So, you know, a maker is someone who like knows how to do stuff with 3D printers and high tech, high technology Kind of stuff, and that's usually you know a, um, that's like usually pictured as a male figure, and it's valued now, and so does artisan. But crafting, you know, is kind of similar to those words, but it's never had the sort of prestige of of making or artisanship because crafting is something women do, you know, and it's something that you do at home. It's not something that um, is celebrated as uh, in the in the broader economy. Uh, you also have um, a, a category of words that um, uh, pushes the notion of, of new technologies. Um, mm -hmm. What words would those be? So data, smart, um, solution, solutions, um, innovation again. I mean, innovation is kind of um, in all of the categories. It's kind of the uh, the er word of the of the book, but smart is is a word that got its start um you know in the military 
the smart bomb, I think, is the way I first encountered the word used in a as a as a way of describing technology. Um, and the smart the smart bomb was originally called the um, a hobo in the Vietnam War, which was a sort of a portmanteau of homing bomb. And then oh, they kind yeah. of they rebranded they rebranded it as a smart bomb, uh, which is probably a smart move on their part. And now it describes, you know, any kind of technology that is thought to have, uh, on the one hand, thought to have an intelligence of its own, but really what that means is that it's thought to be kind of linked to our own intelligence or our own desires. And so, you know, the smart refrigerator, which knows when we need to buy more milk or the, the smart bed that knows just how puff, you know, fluffy you like your mattress to be. I want to talk about a couple other words here too that I I sort of um I've probably interviewed um over the years two or three people who have grit in the title of their book. Um <laughs> what is that but but I and some I think are in the context in which you're talking about but there's there is a quality to it that always um well, uh, that always, I think, uh, stuck in my craw a little bit. What, what, give us the word grit. What are the implications of that word? Well, grit is another example of a word that is both very much of our time and very old as well, because it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of version of a, of a story that uh, goes back to Horatio Alger and the celebration of the what he often called pluck, but he also called it grit of working class youth who have to pull themselves up through their own ingenuity and their own cleverness. And these were sort of supposed to be lessons to, to, to wealthy soft kids. And the way grit is used now is to celebrate what its principal theorist calls uh, the combination of passion and um, intelligence so passion and devotion to a particular job. So if you have grit, you are um, passionate about the work you're doing. You have the strength to overcome challenges. And if you don't have grit, you'll succumb to those challenges. So what's to me what's pernicious about the word, and especially in the way that it's, used, it's preached to poor children, uh, or working class children in the United States, because it's an educational value, I think, above all, um, is that it says, well, if you, uh, it says to you that you can overcome any obstacle, that nothing is impossible for you if you have grit. Um, but if you fail to accomplish your your career goals, or if you fa- fail to accomplish whatever your goals are, then that must suggest that you didn't have grit. And so it's a way of explaining away the inequality of the systems we have rather than a way of um, attempting to transform them. That's the major problem with it. And is there and, – and can you develop grit? Is that the big thing? You, you can? Yeah, you, you can develop grit, but – That's – it's a supposedly an optimistic idea, yes. Um, it's, it's not something that you're born with. I mean, and that's the way Right, that because it, you it, can't be bo- – if you were born with it, it would, ru- it would undercut the real value of grit, which is that – it's available to anybody if, but, but it's like, it's sort of like there are multiple layers, right. Of moral righteousness that are involved Mm -hmm. here. Um, Mm -hmm. you, you can acquire grit. So society is equal, but you just, it's not so much that you're in a position to acquire grit. It's just a question if you are morally righteous enough to go after grit. And then once you get grit, you can use the grit to achieve stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so, but it, but I think it's, you know, I think it uh, is so unfair to people um, who are in a position where um, they need to be grittier than the next kid uh, to to say that if you, uh, you know, if if something goes wrong, it must have been your fault because you you weren't gritty enough or you didn't develop grit in the proper way. So, you know, like, again, it doesn't it doesn't actually propose to transform the systems we have. It just it offers people this, I think, fantasy that they can um, make their own way within it. But if everybody was equally gritty, then, you know, 
And then we would have the exact same situation we have when, if nobody had any grit, right? Which is just that, like, it's great to have grit, but it's much easier if your dad owns a newspaper, let's say, or a major broadcasting company or something like that. Right. Um, yeah, so if everybody was equally gritty, then we just need to be even grittier. And then <laughs> it, the, the grit arms race would just go on forever. And it also feels like it's something that you, it, it's even, and, and we should talk about maybe meritocracy as well, but grit is, it seems to be, to be even more of a nebulous term than meritocracy, than the merit, mm-hmm. right? Like merit almost feels like you could measure, but grit seems impossible to measure. Like if you had just had 25% more grit, you would have overcome the fact that, um, you know, you, um, you were not a legacy uh, admissions to, um, uh, to Yale or something like that. 25% more grit plus the fact that you went to uh, a state school would have gotten to you where that guy who got into Yale was. You can't make that measurement at all. Yeah, I mean, you know, Angela Duckworth, the psychologist who's most associated with the word, uh, I does claim to have a metric for it, but uh, it doesn't make sense to me. And I, you know, I agree. It's like, it's such a moral characteristic um, that the idea of measuring it not only seems impossible, but also just cruel. um, If you, if you, even if you could. Um, Talk about meritocracy. Meritocracy is, a word that began its life as a mockery of the idea of meritocracy. (laughs) So basically it was coined um, by a British writer to, by a British sociologist to, to make fun of the idea that um, in Britain, that uh, old class inequalities and old old class allegiances were being uh, phased out in, in, um, and and that people's success was now contingent on their education. So the idea, the joke of the word was that it was a combination of merit, the thing you supposedly get at school, and aristocracy, the thing that you're born with. Um, and what he was what he was saying is that Britain was simply replacing an inherited system of privilege with a system of privilege that you got access to through your access to elite educational institutions. So it was a way of um, kind of reframing inherited privilege and granting it the veneer of um, democracy, basically. It's, it's basically a surrogate for inherited uh, privilege. But yeah, seems... instead of just being born with it, you're born with the idea that you're born able to go to Oxford, and, and, and that's how you... Um, that's how you ascend to wealth and privilege. I should say that and, I also my understanding is that the the saying uh, "pull yourself up by the boots, uh, bootstraps" and I guess bootstrapping is one of those terms now. That too was introduced as a satire. That oh, pe- was it the, my understanding is that the the introduction of "pull yourself up by the bootstraps" was mocking people who were saying that you could do that because. It's physically impossible to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. <laughs> yeah, and I've often thought about if you actually did, you would just sort of flip over and land on your head. Right. So, yeah, so it makes sense as a joke better, more than it makes sense as, a, as an actual... And then somehow it got adopted. Like, how does that happen? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's strange. And it, it speaks, I think, in part to um, just the... Kind of cravenness of um, a lot of our discourse of business and and um, and the way we talk about class and the way we talk about business and the way we talk about uh, inequality uh, is that there you know there's a, a just r- real kind of sometimes shameless desire to uh, reframe any kind of inequality or unfairness as somehow uh, this is actually just a way of of uh, transcending your limitations, you know? So like meritocracy got adopted by the Blair government really enthusiastically in Britain in the nineties to celebrate the very thing that it was intended to criticize in the first place, to celebrate the, the idea that um, the government, the the country would be run by people, by the smartest people, the people who got the best grades, who went to the best schools 
Um, and at no point, I, apparently, did anybody reflect on the fact that the ability to get the best grades and go to the best schools was a reflection of all kinds of inherited privileges and um, and inequalities. Do you think there is a, you know, when I look at some of these words, I mean, I, I wonder if there isn't a, um, uh, a, a desire to accept these, I guess, the implications of these words by people who are not using them in a cynical fashion, right? Like the, the, like it's really attractive to believe that there's a meritocracy and it's really attractive that you could be able to pull your, your, um, your, yourself up by your own boots, uh, because that would imply like, you know, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a force that is accessible to me that actually can defeat gravity or physics. Like, I mean, you know, like it, it, there, there's a hopeful quality to these things. And that seems to be, you know, whether it's like, you know, uh, life hacks or, um, you know, uh, uh, well, all the smart stuff and, uh, you know, uh, pivoting and, and all of these, uh, mm-hmm. these things imply even a marketplace, right? Because we, I can go into a market and I can get, uh, stuff. Um, I mean, yes. the, there, there's all, it all seems to be on some level, you know, providing hope where they're really, where we're in some respects, these words are telling us that like things are already predetermined, but you can still contemplate the idea that you could change it. Yeah, I think that's precisely what most of them do. And that's what most of them are intended to do. I mean, grit is a really good example, again, because um, it's explicitly designed. I mean, this is how Duckworth talks about it in her book to counter the idea of genius. So she begins the book by talking about how she got a genius grant. But, uh, you know, one of those MacArthur genius grants. But how she didn't like being called a genius because genius is suggests that you're you know, you're born with it or something, and so grit is about you know again it's about like transcending these ideas about um, people who are just destined to be good and people who are just destined to be failures by saying that we can all do it if we get grit, um, and you know like to use another one of our popular metaphors, when you said define gravity, it made me think of it you know climbing the ladder of opportunity. Um, you know, there's a ladder has rungs at the bottom and has rungs at the top. So if you're, if, if we're all climbing the ladder of opportunity, someone's at the bottom, you know, if we're not all, we can't all be at the top of the ladder or the ladder would fall over. And so these kinds of ideas of, um, mobility that we get in concepts like grit and that we get in, uh, concepts like flexibility, uh, empowerment, choice, all of which I, you know, I talk about in the book, um, are all about reframing, kind of increasingly onerous obligations, increasingly um, exhausting and poorly compensated work, increasingly um, bleak options we have in, say, a public school system um, as opportunities as things we should be grateful for. And so what is the, 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 the totality of it? What is, what is problematic in a broad sense of this? Like, you know, how does, how does this language in its totality, um, inhibit progress? Well, I mean, I think first of all, just, it celebrates competition, um, above as, as just like the ultimate, value above all else and you know in um, grit is a you know to come back to grit you know children are all supposed to be competing with each other to get ahead to like elbow out the 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 kid who's not gritty enough um and that's a kind of distressing and depressing idea of what you know a, what a grade school education is supposed to be about um entrepreneurship is again all about the zeal to elbow out your competition to win, uh, to uh, accumulate more. And it it celebrates that as just a kind of uh, deep intrinsic value, you know, where, where, where we might think about things like, I don't know, um, cooperation or solidarity or old fashioned things like that as being, um, as, as being more valuable, you know, but, 
the ways that these these words all kind of they normalize competition, they camouflage exploitation, and so they inhibit. I think ultimately they kind of inhibit our inhibit our political and um, and cultural imagination. That's good a place as any uh, to stop. Uh, John Patrick Leary, the book is Keywords, The New Language of Capitalism, a really uh, fascinating book. I really appreciate your time today. Well, thanks a lot for having me. All right, folks, we're going to take a uh, quick break, head into the fun half, wherein we will uh, talk a little bit more about uh, Bernie Sanders uh, at Fox and Eric uh, Swalwell, uh, Swalwell's bold new idea on how to um, salvage the uh, country. Here is a clue. It involves no red states and no blue states and just uh, coming together with a uh, a cabinet of um, what does he call it? A cabinet team of rivals. Team of rivals. Yes. Where yeah. did I where have I heard that before? Gosh, it's not even that good of a book. No, but it but that was what Obama. <laughs> yeah, no. Lincoln, white boy. Doris Kearns, good one. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, we will also hear from uh, a whole. We got uh, Glenn Beck. I, I don't know if people uh, caught this, but when I was talking about when I was in Las Vegas at the um, at the uh, lawyers conference, I look up and I see a dude I know who used to have a show on the Blaze Network. He is a he was a comedian. He's a comedian. He's a very uh, uh, funny guy, actually, uh, but a little bit libertarian leaning. He's not he's not like uh, Glenn Beckish, um, but I think the the uh, getting involved in legal cases and hearing about the hot coffee, getting into that, I think is starting to like wear him down a little bit. It was a little bit rough for him to. But then we had uh, dinner one night, and then you know things got went a little sideways. Whenever I started eating and drinking, you went on an ice cream bender. We know. I know the chis gelato is so good. Too many. You're wrong about Social Security. Mmm, that's delicious. I mean, Can I have it more. Was almost exactly that, except for it was not <laughs> Social Security. We were having a big argument. That isn't how the legal system big, works. Ooh, try the pistachio. That it, it was. <laughs> It was it was actually very similar to that, um, and I, but I got you know at one point you hit 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 a point where you're like oh I forgot, I forgot this is what this is what his politics are about. I forgot your yeah. thoughts. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, uh, but um, oh we we're going to be talking Glenn Beck maybe in the uh, fun half. Uh, just a reminder, you can support this program by going to jointhemajorityreport dot com. When you do, you're not only supporting the free show, we're giving you extra content every day. Are we giving, doing over the vacation? Have we picked out any stuff? We should maybe pick out some stuff, some Deep Vault stuff. Do you want to take a look in the Deep Vault again, Brendan? You guys thought you were going to get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> look at look it. Look it. Oh, my God. It's true. He really looks like he wants to. They're really... <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe we'll do two or three, two or three, two or three shows, five, two or three, two or three of the this default guy wrote stuff. One episode of that's, Chappelle's show. It's not. It's it's absolutely not. That's not the issue. Is the original um, the one you did on the best show? Is that audio? Do we have that audio available? We do have that audio available. That might be a good one to put on there. I I haven't actually heard that, that myself. Good. Have that's, you not? That's no. Very oh, I got to find that because he pulled it down. Because I think a lot of people were 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 were, were pulling it down at one point. And so that was one of the few things that he, I don't know, the years ago that he didn't have that he pulled down for whatever reason. Um, I'm seeing a request in the Discord for my show, which was very funny. I don't know. Was it this year where we did the bit that the Bush family are all shape-shifting reptiles? That was 2016. Okay, except Jeb can't shape-shift. Do you remember that? (laughs) Aww, <laughs> he's classic. just like, hey guys, we're play Scrapple tonight. And George W's just like, how I about we think turn we're gonna into be hawks and fly? <laughs> come on, come on in, guys. Oh, sorry, Jeb. sorry, Jeb. Oops, sorry, Jeb. You guess, guess you're gonna stay home. Oh, I guess Jeb's gonna stay on that rock while the rest of us uh, swim around with our fins. 
What? Uh, what? How would we even find that? No. Yeah. Oh, sorry, champ. I mean, we can pull. Can't do I didn't put anything into the. Anyways, except for uh, massage, Bob. Bob. The point being <laughs> that um, for just uh, pennies a day, uh, you can have access to all of that great content. Like uh, God, you may have missed the. The Bush family shapeshifter make fun of Jeb segment that we did. <laughs> Such a good thing. That was a that golden was a era. Bit. That was. That was. Making fun of Jeb Bush. In the same way that making fun of Jeb Bush propelled Donald Trump. Right. also exactly. propelled the majority. That's right. And then, of course, it all, yes, didn't work out so well. So, And it wasn't quite so funny anymore no. to make fun of Barbara molesting Jeb or them not being able to shapeshift. Remember, right. you remember what George W. said? I remember this is another classic line, one of, one of your lines, when you said, <laughs> This is beanbag. How, how George W. walks in on Jeb massaging Barbara's bunions or something like that. And he's just like, Sorry, Mom, I've got my old girlfriend now. <laughs> Jeb oh, loser. real mother boy hours. Yes. Oh. So it's uh, jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, folks, you have uh, two weeks left in the month of April in which to go to justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. And uh, you don't even need to use the coupon code MAJORITY. You will get 30% off your coffee. Great opportunity for you to try all the different types of coffees they have at Just Coffee and uh, check it out. Then you can just uh, order on a regular basis So the the key is in this uh, time is to go and you get a bunch of like uh, the one pound bags, try a bunch of different coffees, see which ones you like. If you don't like one, you re-gift it to somebody and then uh, you buy that one uh, over and over again. Uh, today is Tuesday. Oh, my gosh. Look at you, Michael. What's uh, what's happening tonight? What's happening tonight is. Professor- oh, is that why you're not wearing a track suit? Because you do oh, no, I'll show? be in a full suit tonight. I'll be. Yeah. I'll be attired in a suit suit. Is that what you do? This you... is the this is the intermediary stage. Oh, I see. Okay. Proper shirt on Thursday, then usually on Tuesday during the day. Track suit. Rest you had track week. suit on Thursday last week, I think. Wow. Or wait, one of the. Oh yeah, you're right. I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> Nike track suit. It's starting to bleed into your whole dope. like all the time. I'm not mad at it. I like the track suit. Well, let me just give you a piece of advice. I'm not You're gonna, gonna look back. You're gonna look back on this and it's gonna be regretful for you. Absolutely not gonna take fashion advice from I, you. You don't have to. Yeah, that's okay. I'm uh Let's I'm communicating other it's not just me. I wouldn't know. <laughs> to me, I'm like, yeah, tracksuit all the time. Oh, wow. of course. You, oh really uh, many people are saying, huh? Yeah, there's a lot of people saying. I mean it's all right. Lots of people. I'm I'm just aware of regret. I'm not where, specifically in terms of fashion. I just know how regret works. I'll regret when I wear the Eddie Murphy delirious suit. Yeah, you may that have already. I feel like you're sort of no, spiraling I, a little bit. But go I, ahead. Not quite there yet, but I'm working up towards it. Tonight, Professor Richard Wolf returns. We're going to be talking about UBI, Gramsci, Hegemony, uh, and then, of course, you know Bernie uh, at Fox News and uh, a bunch of other things. We're live at 7 p.m., uh, tonight, Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel. We are uh, tickets from being sold out to the Saturday live show. So if you want it, come to L.A. Uh, April uh, this Saturday at the Bootleg Theater with the team and Anna Kasparian, Big Waz, and Nando Vila. Patreon.com slash TMBS for the whole thing. And obviously, we uh, the reason we doubled up this week is we will not have a, li- uh, a live regular scheduled show next week because we're on vacation, but we'll have a bunch of new clips and uh, all of the usual Patreon uh, shows as well. Jamie. This week on the Antifada, we got out of the studio and went to the Socialism in Our Time conference which was a joint venture between historical materialism and Jacobin. And we did some interviews on the fly. So uh, Sean's still editing it together right now. I'm not sure 100% what's going to make the final cut, but we've got stuff on uh, Marxist analysis of gaming, unionizing the marginal in the UK, uh, the ways that the family unit has changed under capitalism and openings to build something better. um, And also... A little interview on the situation in Venezuela with the great George Chicarello Mar. So check it out. Oh, that's dope. Thank you. We're going to want to hear that. 
Um, yeah, Matt. Literary Hangover, check out the Oscar Wilde episode if you haven't, and you want uh, ammunition to respond to the uh, trolling about Bernie's charitable spending. Uh, Oscar Wilde was already on the train that uh, philanthropy is a joke and what you really need to do is abolish private property, so uh, check that episode out, folks. Oh, uh, Risk is going to be on right before you guys. What? On Saturday, April 20th? Right before your show. Risk? Yeah. Which one's Um, he's uh Risk is a um is Wait. a podcast. Oh, Kevin Allison? Yeah. That's so funny. I didn't, you know, cuz Kevin Allison actually was at the TMBS uh Bellhouse show. Yeah, no, he's a fan of uh, both our shows. Yeah, Kevin's awesome. I didn't realize the timing on that. That's cool. That show is about people like tell like a story they've never told publicly before. Right. It's actually really interesting. Kevin's a really cool guy. Former uh, member of the state. That was an MTV show, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, do I feel old? All right, folks. I see, wasn't even trying to make. See, you feel I know. That way on that I know. One. That's why it made. That's what really hurt. See you in the fun half. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. The win-win. It's a win.